Please join me in our morning prayer. We'll pray the collect together in unison. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and call us from the chaos of the world into your peaceful presence. Holy God, you know the disorder of our sinful lives. Set straight our crooked hearts and bend our wills to love your goodness and your glory in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church here in Florence. We're so glad that you're with us today. And I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing our opening hymn, Morning Has Broken. <laughs> standing and let us unite in the historic confession of our Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed, which you can find printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He had ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Again, good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church here in Florence, Alabama. I'm Dale Cohen, Senior Pastor, and on behalf of Reverend Dr. Terry Stubblefield, our associate, who will be bringing our message today, we're so glad that you're with us. We welcome those of you who are joining us online. We hope and pray that you'll be able to participate fully in our worship service today. We'll have all of the words to everything included on the screen, and we want you to feel very much a part of what we do here in the sanctuary. I want to ask you to go to fumcflow.org where you can register your attendance or there on Facebook you can just write in the comment section that you're present. We'd love to know that you're here with us today. 
Those of you in the sanctuary, I encourage you to fill out the connection card that's part of the worship guide. And in just a few moments, when the offering plates are passed, you can drop your completed cards into the offering plate. With the change in the CDC guidelines regarding face masks, we're changing our policy here at First United Methodist Church, leaving the decision to mask up to you as an individual. If, however, you're at high risk, or if you happen to be seated near someone who is at high risk and they ask for you to wear a mask, please do so. Uh, we don't want anybody to get sick for being in uh, the sanctuary together and just let's be respectful of one another. Our prayers are with the people in Ukraine as they deal with the invasion of the Russian troops. We also pray for the world leaders who are trying to stop the aggression diplomatically. And we pray for ourselves that we might rightly acknowledge the inhumanity that war anywhere forces upon people everywhere. May God's peace break through the violence so that a resolution to this dangerous situation might be found and that the suffering might be minimized and no more damage is done. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. And in our church, Transfiguration Sunday always falls before Lent. On Transfiguration Day, that was the day that Jesus went up the mountain with Peter, James, and John, three of his disciples. And being in God's presence, Jesus is countenance was transformed, it was transfigured. And so what this points to is the mystery that God's presence plays in our lives, that none of us can be in God's presence and it not have some kind of impact on us. And Terry's got a great message to share today and so I'm looking forward to hearing it again. Our vision as a church is to offer creative experiences that lead people to inspiring encounters with God meaningful engagement with each other, and lifelong transformation. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. It's the beginning of a seven-week period leading up to Easter that we use as a time of self-examination and reflection, trying to find ways that we can deepen our relationship with God. We know that we can never exhaust the depths of that relationship, that the deeper we go, the deeper we can go. And Lent is an opportunity for us to do that. On Ash Wednesday, here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m., we'll have a service and we'll impose ashes in the sign of a cross on the forehead of those who come forward to receive it. And these ashes are made from the palm branches from last year's Palm Sunday to maintain a connection from year to year of how we're continually growing in our relationship with God. And then the following Wednesday, March the 9th, we'll begin our study on the grace of Les Miserables by Matt Rawl, and would love for you to join us. We serve dinner on Wednesday evenings at 5 p.m., beginning at 5, and if you would like to reserve for dinner, you can include that on your registration slip, or you can call the church office by noon tomorrow. Next Sunday, we'll have auditions for the play Smoke on the Mountain, and those will be held at 2 p.m. in McDowell Hall, and there's more information in the worship guide about that. As we prepare to receive our offering today, I always think about conversations that I've had with people about giving, and one of the predominant conversations centers around, well, I always feel so guilty. I wish that I could give more. Well, I want you to think about God this way. God is like a father whose child comes bringing a gift, and regardless of the value of that gift, God delights in whatever it is the child brings. And so, as you give, I want to encourage you to, to push guilt aside. Certainly, you know, that's one of the spiritual disciplines that we need to all examine from time to time. But when you make a gift, give with joy. And let that joy add to the satisfaction of the gift that you give. And you can trust that no matter what it is, that God is delighting in what you have to offer. And so as we prepare to receive our offering this morning, I want to invite Calvin to come forward 
and to offer a prayer of consecration for our gifts. Calvin? Let us pray. God of all creation, the offering that we bring to you this morning to your altar is the fruit of our labors, and we want to bring you the very best of all that we have. No harvest comes from us alone, but starts in your goodness, and many have contributed to every good gift that we bring this morning. Working together in your fields, generous God, we pray that our gifts might be used to bless others who hunger for connection with you. For it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Hey. 
If you would, pray, bow and pray with me this morning. I'll open our uh, morning prayer, and I'll allow you a first couple of minutes there to lift your own personal concerns to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we meet this morning as a family in your presence. We meet as brothers and sisters in Christ and accepting the responsibility that that places upon us, that we love one another as you have loved us, to be a light in a dark, dark world, to do unto others as we would have them do unto us, simply to be your children. Draw us into your arms that we might fully know your love and your joy and your peace as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when he taught them, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from three different books, Exodus, 2 Corinthians, and Isaiah. Let's begin with Exodus 34, 29 through 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and as he came down from the mountain with two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. Since then we have such a hope, we act as with great boldness, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened, indeed, to this very day. When they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ it is set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. In Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, He who formed you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. The word of the Lord. Good morning, church. We're so glad to see you. When you look around, do you know everybody's name here today? You probably don't. God knows all of our names. Does that bother you? Does that make you nervous? Does that scare you that God knows your name? God is not taking names like, what's your name, boy? <laughs> Have you ever heard that? God knows our names. And it should be a reassuring thing that God knows us. In our lectionary readings for today, from Exodus 34... We have the events at Mount Sinai described where Moses received the Ten Commandments. 
Our, another lectionary reading that we didn't read today is a familiar passage to you from Luke 9 where Jesus is transformed, the transfiguration. 2 Corinthians 3, Paul takes all of these events and puts them in context by telling us that we can look at and face God and not be afraid. And then Isaiah 43, 1 tells us not to fear God. Now, admittedly, religion can be scary for a lot of people. Even us that have grown up in church or have been Christians for a long time. It's hard to believe, but what is it about religion that makes people uncomfortable or frightens people? Well, it's true that throughout history, there have been people who have used religion to create fear and to cause division when they twist and abuse God's words. Even now, when we have the freedom to believe what we choose, some people still fear religion. For some people, when they hear the gospel message of free salvation, it just sounds too good to be true. I mean, we've heard of our lives. If it sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. What's the catch? We're afraid maybe of a cosmic bait and switch where we're not hearing all the details of God's plan. Most of us really at times believe that we're not good enough. We haven't done enough to be saved. The gospel that promises us new life by the free grace of God as a free gift to free us from the chains that bind us sounds great, but we don't really believe it sometimes. Even when we hear the good news and it creates in us a hunger to know God and His gift He offers, we're still afraid that there's maybe nothing we can do for ourselves when it comes to our eternal destiny. Maybe we're afraid of stepping over boundaries that are drawn by religion and fall into a bottomless pit where we lose ourselves, our lives, and our souls. Well, in today's lesson, we have stories of people who get close to God and they were scared. In Exodus chapters 19 through 34, we read the account of God's people recently escaping slavery in Egypt, making their way to the promised land, and they stop at Mount Sinai to receive God's commandments, a way to live. And they are there to express their thankfulness to God. But when they got close to the mountain, it all turns to fear and not joyful worship. God told to Moses, tell the people to get ready. Tell them to clean themselves up, wash their clothes, get ready to encounter God. They were warned not to touch the mountain where God would come to mo meet Moses. Don't go past the fence. Stay clean. Moses brought the people to the foot of the mountain and they saw thick clouds, fire, and lightning. They saw and heard thunder and the blast of horns. They felt the earthquake. Moses would speak and God would answer with thunder. Maybe they were afraid of standing before a holy and awesome God. And when Moses came down to the mountain after talking to God, his face was shining and they were afraid. So Moses made a covering, a veil to put over his face when he was talking to the people. Well, there's other stories in the Bible of people being afraid of God, of God's presence, afraid of Jesus, afraid of the angels. Today is Transfiguration Sunday, and in Luke 9, we have a brief retelling of the Transfiguration. We read, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and went up on the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, talked to Jesus. And Peter said, Jesus, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, three monuments, three memorials. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was speaking, a cloud came down and covered him, enveloped him. And in that cloud, a voice came and said, This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. And the cloud lifted and only Jesus remained. And they were speechless. They came down the mountain with Jesus without talking. They didn't know what to say at that point. Well, Peter had blurted out, I know what we need to do. Let's make a tent, a memorial for Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. And then God spoke. The cloud disappeared and they were speechless. Well, in Matthew 28, the women disciples came after the Sabbath to finish the burial preparations for Jesus. 
And we're told that an earthquake and an angel had rolled a stone off the tomb. The guards were terrified. They had passed out. The women were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. Jesus is risen from the dead. Go tell the others. Now, years later in 2 Corinthians 3 that Calvin read, Paul is reflecting on all of these events. And he's combining them with Jesus coming to earth to reveal God to us. And he's teaching us these truths about God. He said the veil that Moses wore after he encountered God was a symbol of everything that keeps us from seeing the glory of God. And God wants us to see and experience his glory that fills the earth with love and joy and hope. Paul says that the presence of the Spirit of God sets us free so that we with unveiled faces can look at God, knowing that we too will be glorified to be made like Him. In Isaiah 43, 1, God's people are told, Do not fear, I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. God knew these, God knew these people. God knows us. There's a great comfort that God knows each of us by name. God knows us in what we're experiencing. We're all on a journey, different journeys in different places. But God promises to be with all of us on our way home. Knowing someone's name implies a relationship. And God is the great namer, the great claimer. The Isaiah passage goes on to say, when you pass through the troubles... Not if you pass through the troubles. When you pass through the troubles. He says, when you pass through the fire. Not if you'll pass through the fire. Because we all will. We all do. But God says, when you do, I will be with you. Difficult days. Lonely days. Days of grief and sorrow. In the worst of moments, it makes a world of difference that we're not alone. This is also the good news. God is still doing that. God gathers his people from different places, on different journeys, because God knows we need each other. God calls each of us by name. He knows our names. Sure he does. He's God. He made everything. But we all know the gift of knowing someone's name. When you're new, when you're sad, when you're lonely or when you're hurting, there's a sacredness to people knowing your name. It means a lot. God knows our names. It may seem like a simple thing, but it matters. God knows. God remembers our names. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's all stand and we're going to sing together. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Thank mm-hmm. you. God knows our name. 
and he calls it to tell us that he loves us. And so may you go forth from this place with the full knowledge that you belong to God as his beloved. Go in peace. Serve the Lord with gladness in all you do. Amen.